It seems like almost every time a new weapon system, be it Russian or Western, is sent to Ukraine, there's always going to be at least some voices in the media that amp this thing up as the next great game changer. The system that will finally change the dynamics of this long and bloody war. For some systems, the hype dies out, whereas for others, it builds and builds. Until, eventually, the system arrives in Ukraine, someone uses it, and reality and expectations finally collide. Some get to Ukraine and turn out to be utter disappointments. Others turn out to be solid, useful performers that do the job they're intended to do, but don't exactly quickly or efficiently move the needle. And others swing in like a damn wrecking ball and on their first day of operations wreck two Russian airfields and deal the Russian aerospace forces their worst single-day defeat since they were the Soviet air forces during the Second World War. Because when you're trying to pack more than 900 cluster munitions into a single ATACMS missile, there's exactly zero room left for moderation or chill. In the end, determining whether a system is effective, efficient and game-changing or not can usually only be done over time. And more than 600 days into Russia's full-scale invasion, I think we're in a position to start looking at some of the systems heralded as game-changers in Ukraine, and to ask what kind of impacts they've actually ended up having. Not just because it might help us shape our understanding of how this war might continue to evolve, but also because it helps us explore questions about how you might evaluate the effectiveness of a weapon system, and what sort of development and procurement decisions militaries around the world might be making as they watch Ukraine and learn. So to crack this topic open, I'm first going to have a look at the concept of game-changing or Wonder Weapons 101. Why do we always seem to be so obsessed with them, and how might you determine whether or not a system actually deserves the title? Then I'm going to pick a few game-changing systems in Ukraine and work our way through them, trying to do some general assessment around their impact and efficiency, noting there is absolutely no way I can cover every hyped-up weapon system in Ukraine in a single video. But for today, we'll cover some of the highest-profile examples, things like Javelin, Lancet, Western Main Battle Tanks, HIMARS and ATACMS. And if the video goes well, in the future we might look at a couple of more, including some of the more spectacular failures, as well as systems that I don't think always get game-changer accolades, but probably deserve them. That'll then leave us to close out with some final thoughts, but for now, let's just jump into it. Okay, so what might we mean when we're talking about a game-changing weapon, and what might it take to qualify? Because history is full of examples of, in some cases, legitimately revolutionary weapon systems, that attracted enormous expectations from the public, military, or political leadership. Modern marketing often tends to favour terms like revolutionary or game-changing, but another term you'll sometimes hear used is Wunderwaffe, a term used by German propaganda during World War II to describe a series of often quite technologically advanced wonder weapons like the V-2 rocket that were meant through sheer technological innovation to somehow overcome allied advantages in more banal and boring areas like industrial production, manpower, and logistics. It represented an extreme version of the trend through much of human history to hope that just one more system, one innovation, one action might change the dynamics of a battlefield or indeed an entire war. An awful lot of the time, would-be game changers do not in fact end up changing the game. The German ME-163 Comet was a rocket-powered interceptor and by far the fastest military aircraft in the world at the time of its introduction. It was also, to apply the correct technical lingo, complete dog shit as a military aircraft tended to explode and kill its pilots and the entire project was a massive waste of finite resources. If it changed the game, so to speak, at all, it may only have been in the sense that it helped the Allies win the war just that little bit faster. But that doesn't mean a single system or a single capability isn't capable of changing the dynamics even of a very large conflict. To stick with World War II aircraft examples for a moment, in many respects the P-51D Mustang was just another fighter. The difference was, it was a fighter with the range necessary to escort Allied strategic bombers deep into German territory, while also dogfighting with German defending fighters on more or less even terms. Its introduction meant US bombers could hit those targets while suffering many fewer losses than they used to, while also significantly increasing losses and attrition among German fighters. It also led to the near extinction of certain German systems and tactics. For example, the Germans had previously found that heavy twin-engine fighters were quite effective in taking down unescorted American heavy bombers. But those slower, less agile, and sometimes rocket-armed aircraft were extremely vulnerable if they encountered an agile single-seat escort fighter like the Mustang. My point here is that a system doesn't have to be sci-fi technology in order to be a game-changer. Sometimes it's just about bringing the right characteristics for the conflict at hand. And because human optimism bias is absolutely a thing, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, there are always going to be some commentators on both sides that think their next system is inevitably going to be a Mustang, not a Comet. In Ukraine, at least, I'd argue there's often a sort of cycle around the supply of game-changing weapon systems, quote-unquote. 
First might come a debate over whether or not a weapon system should be supplied, meaning you'll often see plenty of advocacy and hype. That might be the media wanting to generate clicks or advocates wanting to get a system delivered. Because if you're trying to mobilise political capital, it's sometimes best not to say the system in question is honestly a bit mid. Then you'll often hit the phase where, as with many things in life, reality and expectations meet. And whenever that encounter turns into a fight, reality has a way of curb stomping the opposition. What follows, whether a system is a massive success or a complete failure, is often a phase of adaptation. The user tests out new ways to deploy and leverage the system, and the defender finds new ways to defend against or adapt to it. Eventually, over time, you might hit a new stable or at least semi-stable situation, and it's often only then that you can really start to talk about evaluating a system's impact. So in setting out to illustrate how you might try and evaluate potential game-changing systems in Ukraine, today I'm setting two sets of ground rules. The first was, what does it take to get selected for evaluation in the first place? Here, there are two basic requirements. A system must have received a lot of hype in the media. And secondly, we have to have at least some data available that might be used for evaluation purposes. The second question is, how do you actually evaluate the systems in question? For actual militaries, this can be a pretty involved process that we've talked a bit about before. But for YouTube purposes today, we're just going to apply three simplified metrics. Direct impact or effect, efficiency, and a more holistic impact analysis. That first one, direct impact, is probably the simplest. What did the system actually do? How many artillery pieces have been destroyed by Russian lancets, and how many Russian tanks have been lost to javelins? But in a conflict where both sides have finite resources, I'd argue it's also important to measure efficiency. Efficiency measures what the system is achieving against the cost of acquiring, fielding, and sustaining it. Those measures can point in very different directions, and different groups can be invested in different ones. Let's say, for example, you engaged in the traditional American military pastime of destroying Toyotas using tomahawks. That might be a pretty quick and reliable way to have a direct impact. Even the famous Hilux is probably going to struggle with a 450 kilogram warhead. But it is absolutely not cost efficient. And to greatly oversimplify things, troops and uniformed personnel are usually going to care about effect, they just want the job done. While it's going to be the bean counters, force designers, and members of the public who enjoy government services other than the ability to explosively decompile four-wheel drives half a world away, who are going to care more about efficiency. Then there's a measure which I think has to go beyond just how many enemy systems were destroyed and how much did it cost to achieve that impact. This is to do a but-for test, essentially asking the question, if that system had not been supplied and fielded, what would have happened instead? And it's this mode of assessment, among other things, that helps explain why strategic missile defence programs continue to get funding. That's a relatively simple example, built as it is on the assumption that it's usually good to spend any amount of money if it means potentially keeping nuclear warheads away from your cities. But you can get conventional examples that are much more complicated once you start to factor in the impact a system has on enemy decision making as well as your own. If the reason a system like HIMARS, for example, isn't destroying as many ammunition depots as it used to is because Russia has dispersed them or moved them further away from the front, then your measurement of effectiveness should go beyond just the value of the targets destroyed and how much it costs to destroy them, but also what the total impact on the opponent was from forcing them to adapt in that way. Now, even taken together, these criteria don't represent a comprehensive assessment, but for what we're doing today, they'll hopefully suffice. Albeit with the caveat, as always, that we're working with limited information, and that when it comes to evaluating the effectiveness of weapons during an active war, well, the truth often does wear metaphorical camo. So to start illustrating this concept, we're going to go back more or less to where it all began, to a weapon system that was present before February 2022, and which was one of the first to capture international hype once it occurred. America's Javelin anti-tank guided missile. Javelin is a man-portable, fire-and-forget anti-tank guided missile. And according to Rusi estimates, at the time of Russia's full-scale invasion in February 2022, Javelin launches made up about 16% of Ukraine's anti-tank guided missile inventory. At that time, Ukraine was believed to have about 950 ATGM launches of all types, including about 150 Javelin clues. There were, on average, about 10 missiles for every ATGM launcher, with 9,100 total in inventory. The problem, of course, was once the invasion broke and Ukraine found itself fighting the largest tank force in the world using a rapidly mobilising army, well, suddenly 950 launches was about as adequate as planning a road trip across the Australian outback, with half a tank of petrol, one bottle of water, and your mobile phone on 30% charge. Ukraine needed every anti-tank weapon it could get its hands on, and it needed them approximately yesterday. Javelin, along with other systems like Enlor, Panzerfaust, or Matador, were part of the initial response to that requirement. 
Reportedly, something like five to 7,000 Javelin missiles were provided mostly in the early months of the war, and Ukrainians were rapidly trained on these systems by Ukrainian veterans, foreign experts, YouTube videos, or, in at least one case that I read about, a Ukrainian team reportedly just kind of fiddling with it while pointing at a Russian tank until they figured out how to make it go boom. Early on, the Ukrainians actually claimed that they would need as many as 500 Javelins per day. A consumption rate that, if true, would see Ukraine chew through the entire lifetime American production of Javelin missiles in just a couple of months. Suffice to say, that consumption rate absolutely hasn't held in the war to date. But videos of the missile system in use started hitting the internet, the fame of the system grew, and somehow internet meme culture and the military-industrial complex collided to give us Saint Javelin. An image that became so prevalent we saw it being worn by Ukrainian government figures and fronting articles by organisations like the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. So as far as hype levels and game-changer energy goes, Javelin certainly qualified. My question now, more than 600 days on, is what effect did it actually end up having? It's generally assessed, and we've discussed before, how these missiles likely had their greatest impact in the very earliest days of the war. That was a time when Russian columns were often disorganised, dynamic, moving through Ukrainian territory and could be ambushed by teams using ATGMs. During this period, some observers noted the importance of ATGMs in slowing down or halting Russian armoured advances, with the task of actually destroying or breaking up those attacks then being given over to the Ukrainian artillery. In that scenario, ATGMs were acting as the anvil and artillery as the hammer. And under those conditions, we got claimed hit rates for Ukrainian javelin teams of 90 plus percent. But as the war went on, Russia adapted to the ATGM threat. Rusi, for example, notes a number of methods the Russians have used to cut down the thermal signatures of their vehicle to make it harder for heat-seeking weapons like Javelin to achieve a lock. These include fitting vehicles, particularly those in defensive positions, with anti-thermal material which is described as proving highly effective in a Rusi report. For example, the image you see there is of a captured Russian T-90M tank. And the material you see covering it isn't just a fashion statement, it's Nikitka, an anti-thermal covering. Other Russian adaptations include modifying the engine decks of vehicles to reduce the reliability of ATGM engagements, or exploiting thermal crossover, the periods of the day where the vehicle is likely to be closest to the ambient temperature. Even just the practice on both sides of bolting more and more explosive reactive armour to anything with tracks and even some things with wheels probably counts as an adaptation, as we have some reports from Ukrainian tankers of Russian vehicles equipped with ERA protection surviving direct hits from barrel-fired anti-tank guided missiles. Put all of this together, and to quote Rusi, the result is a significant decrease in the probability of kill from several ATGM types, although this is only achievable by imposing a range of tactical constraints on the employment of Russian armour. End quote. So going back to our measurement criteria we assessed earlier, what would all of that mean? Well, it would mean that both the impact and the efficiency of systems like Javelin decreased over time. Impact, because the changing nature of the war, the changing speed of supply, and the introduction of countermeasures reduce the number of vehicles being destroyed by those systems. And efficiency, because those adaptations reduce the probability of kill, meaning more missiles need to be fired to achieve every destroyed tank. But in terms of that holistic but-for test, you could argue things are a little more complicated. Because there, you have to answer questions like, what would have happened to Ukraine if they didn't have systems like Javelin arriving early in the war to help them harass, slow, or stop Russian tank columns? And in a universe where systems like Javelin and Stugna didn't exist, would Russia still have to use these sort of adaptations to protect their armour from them? Your answers to questions like that probably help form your opinion on whether or not systems like Javelin were game-changing or not. Another thing you'll probably want to consider is how much effort was involved in achieving these effects. Talking about Javelin, if we use the figure of 7,000 missiles and round up the production cost to 200,000 per missile, obviously not accurate because a lot of what was sent were older munitions near to their expiration dates, then you arrive at a cost for those weapon systems of 1.4 billion US dollars. You'd normally also have to factor in significant allowances for logistics, training, sustainment, etc. But this isn't a tank or a fighter jet, it's a fire and forget missile. The logistics consisted of throwing a bunch of them in trucks and driving them to Ukraine. The training consisted of crash courses, videos and experimentation. And the sustainment plan, as long as you make sure the missile teams have access to enough batteries for their launch units, basically consists of being able to convert the empty canisters after you fire a missile into a shower, or a fascinating home storage solution more distinctive than anything your mates are going to be able to buy from Ikea. In any case, in purely monetary terms, what would it take for this weapon system to break even, so to speak, if it was primarily being fired against Russian tanks, noting of course that ATGMs in Ukraine are used against plenty of targets, including light vehicles, APCs, 
IFEs, sometimes even buildings and infantry positions, not just tanks. If your average target is a $3 million tank, then you need an engagement success rate of about 6.7% with this missile to break even with the other side. On the range, rates above 90% might be practical, while in Ukraine they're likely to be lower, but probably not that low. To oversimplify things, in the game of war by spreadsheet, Javelin is probably in the green. Coupled with the way they continue to shape the war by, for example, making infantry positions very dangerous for tanks to approach, lest they have one of these in the trench, and the evaluation I tentatively come to right now is that Javelin in Ukraine has probably done its job, and probably done it reasonably efficiently. In the very early war, it may have been a game changer, just by virtue of how quickly it could arrive, be online, and make a difference. Now it and systems like it are more just part of the furniture of the overall war effort. Very much secondary to systems like drones, artillery, and landmines, but still very much efficient contributors relative to the cost of fielding them. Which brings us to some of the larger and more expensive weapon systems that began being sent to Ukraine after Javelin had had its moment in the sun. Because after the last few days in Ukraine, I can't not talk about HIMARS M270 and particularly ATACMS. And for a sense of symmetry, I'll also evaluate them alongside a Russian system which received a lot of hype, the TOS-1A Thermobaric MLRS system. Now we've talked about HIMARS and M270 enough in the past that the systems probably don't need any introduction. HIMARS is what you get when you take a pod of six normally GPS-guided rockets and put them on the back of a truck. M270 is what you get when you take two pods of those rockets and put it on a tracked platform. HIMARS, M270, and M270 equivalents are all essentially NATO 227mm multiple launch rocket systems. So for the purpose of this section, when I'm talking about one, assume I'm talking about all of them. At time of recording, Ukraine is believed to have received 61 of these MLRS systems, 38 of which are HIMARS, and 23 of various versions or equivalents of the M270, including 5 MARS from Germany and 2 LRUs from France. Now, pricing this diverse set of launchers is going to be complicated at the best of times, so as a nice round figure, I'm going to estimate that as $4 million US dollars per launcher for a grand total of $244 million. Then there are the Gimler's rockets to go with the rocket launching vehicles, and here to be conservative, I'm going to presume that every rocket sent was produced at 2023 prices of approximately $170,000 US dollars per missile. That's very obviously not the case, as many older munitions have been sent, but for the sake of simplicity, let's go with it. In terms of how many missiles have been sent, America doesn't disclose exact numbers. At the end of last year, there was a Reuters estimate of about 5,000 to date, so I'm going to use 10,000 to now for a total approximate cost of $1.7 billion. Then we would normally want to consider the training and logistics overhead for operating these systems. Fortunately here, we're only talking about 61 vehicles, and HIMARS in particular is much lower maintenance than some tracked armoured vehicles. That would mean the rough cost for 10,000 Gimler strikes in Ukraine, responsible for all the Gimler's relevant destruction we have seen since the middle of last year, would be about 2 billion US dollars. As for the cost of those HIMARS and M270s that have been visually confirmed lost in Ukraine so far, that's still zero. Even if the Russian MOD continues to reassure their public that they have destroyed all of these systems at least once. In terms of the impact the system had, it's probably best to split this into two phases. The first is the highly disruptive period when first four and then several more HIMARS systems were first delivered to Ukraine in 2022. That's the phase during which, frankly, the Russian army doesn't appear to have been ready for them, and so a comparatively small number of HIMARS systems seemingly operating on a 24-hour basis were for a brief period destroying major Russian ammunition dumps, headquarters, or critical targets every single day. Whether this was the result of each launcher having multiple crews, or the crews that were there being fueled by patriotism and energy drinks, I don't know. But what I think we can be pretty confident of is that at least for a while, a handful of missile trucks did dramatically move the needle on the logistics for the entire Russian army in Ukraine. The system would follow up with another major achievement in 2022, when it was used extensively against the Antonovsky Bridge in Kherson, playing, as before, a significant role in undermining Russian logistics. The high notes of Phase 1, however, were followed by Russian adaptation. Here we can probably split the response into countermeasures to the Gimler's rockets themselves, and adaptation to the way the Russian army operated on the other. On the countermeasures side, the Russians both tried to adopt jamming in order to reduce the accuracy of the GPS-guided Gimler's rockets, and also to begin shooting more of them down using ground-based air defence systems. Now, using interceptors to shoot down incoming artillery rockets may not exactly be cost-efficient, but if it saves a valuable target from being hit and you're Russia and as a result have many, many interceptor missiles, then you can understand why it might make sense for Russia. 
Russia began claiming significant success shooting down Gimler's rounds, and by the May of 2023, Rusi released a report finding as follows. The Russian air defence network is assessed to be achieving a significant number of intercepts against Gimler's munitions, end quote. Then, so far as other adaptations went, the Russians had to change everything from how they stored and dispersed their ammo to how they set up their headquarters. Now, as the war went on in 2023, Gimler's retained that deep strike role, but we've also seen it take on great importance as a counter-battery weapon, with particular apparent value when it comes to targeting very long-range Russian artillery systems like heavy MLRS or the 2S7 Pion, or valuable point targets like, for example, UAV control stations, radars, or jammers. So even though these systems no longer have the same apparent daily impact that they once did, they still play a useful tactical and operational role. While you could argue they also play another role in shaping Russian behaviour. This starts to get into that but for dimension that I mentioned at the start. Because based on what we saw in 2022, it's probable that the way the Russians want to fight is very different from the way HIMARS forces them to fight. As long as Gimlers are present on the battlefield in significant numbers, putting anything valuable in a concentrated spot within 80 kilometers of the front line is potentially asking for trouble. That limits the way Russia can organize its logistics, its command, how many troops it can concentrate for training, and where and how it needs to concentrate and expend limited defensive resources like jammers and air defense systems. In that sense, supplying Ukraine with Gimler's capability was an expensive effort. But countering Gimler's has been a force-wide effort for the Russian army. So even though our data isn't complete, if you start plugging that information into those criteria we identified earlier, HIMARS, M270 and Gimler's all start to look pretty reasonable. In terms of direct effectiveness and impact, we have the ammunition depots and headquarters of the initial strikes, every artillery system and point target that's been subsequently destroyed, as well as a number of particularly infamous mass casualty events. In terms of efficiency, a $170,000 rocket is never going to be a $600 FPV drone, but that doesn't mean it isn't efficient. Valuable point targets like jammers, self-propelled guns, tanks, these are all targets that are sufficiently valuable that on paper you could afford to miss with an entire pod of rockets, follow up with another, hit with the final round fired, and still turn out to be pretty cost efficient. Meanwhile, any Gimler's round that gets intercepted by a Russian air defense missile is probably essentially a wash in terms of cost efficiency, and keeping 60 or so vehicles and their crews operational in Ukraine and fed with ammunition isn't really a super high cost endeavor. I mean, a useful comparison here might be with a very different system in a similar sort of cost range. The TOS-1A is Russia's thermobaric and incendiary MLRS system. Like Ukraine's HIMARS fleet, this was a specialized weapon system. Russia had about 45 of them at the time of the invasion. They received plenty of media hype. And depending on what data source you use, the system is either in the same cost class as HIMARS or indeed more expensive. We talked about some of the impact this system has had in our video on battlefield medicine in Ukraine. It's been used as a specialized weapon, largely against dug-in Ukrainian infantry positions. And when it has been used, it's caused a number of significant mass casualty events and some very significant wounds. But scanning both Russian and Ukrainian sources, you don't see as many reports of impactful deployments as you do with something like HIMARS. And the system seems to have suffered heavily due to its relatively short range. Because you need to roll this thing within five kilometers or so of your target, it's very vulnerable, like anything else that's heavy and valuable that gets close to the front line in Ukraine, to attack by basically anything from enemy drones to artillery. And at time of recording, we had visual confirmation for 11 TOS-1 losses in Ukraine, as well as the destruction of seven dedicated reloading vehicles. The most recent loss was only a few days ago, caused by a cheap FPV drone. That isn't to say this hasn't been a sometimes useful and always terrifying weapon system but rather the impact and efficiency of that system might be a little different than it is for the NATO 227mm. And I think that difference becomes even clearer when you start doing holistic impact and but-for analysis, because there's just so many hypothetical questions you can pose that, in the absence of the system, might have had more uncomfortable answers for Ukraine. For example, without the ammunition depot rampage in 2022, when does the initial Russian offensive actually end up culminating and how many more Ukrainians are lost in it? Without HIMARS, what does the Kherson campaign look like? Without the constant threat of deep strikes, what does Russian logistics look like in 2023? What does Russian command look like in 2023? And how much more damage could the Russian artillery be doing to Ukrainian forces if it wasn't being targeted by HIMARS? So how you would evaluate these systems as a whole is probably still an open question. At a high level, you could probably argue that HIMARS lived up to its initial hype, and that unlike Javelin, it continues to have a very significant level of relevance. But ultimately, that judgment should always be tempered against the resources necessary to field the system. 
If I spend the time and money recruiting Lionel Messi and then send him onto the field, I'm going to be disappointed if he doesn't have an outsized impact. And in a sense, that was kind of true for these systems. Meanwhile, TOS 1A doesn't seem to have lived up to its initial hype, but that doesn't mean it's not making a valuable contribution. It's certainly not war-defining or game-changing, but it's a specialised tool that's very valuable in certain scenarios, even if the system has taken significant losses. And I'd also note that the way systems like this can be used can also change over time. Which is why, for me, one of the big questions is what happens to the effectiveness of M270 and HIMARS if we see new munitions begin to arrive for them in Ukraine, and as a result, their role and capability expands. One example we've talked about before that should arrive soon that may or may not be initially compatible with the launchers is the ground launch small diameter bomb. On paper, this should give Ukraine a longer range option, something like 150 kilometers rather than the 80 of the Gimlas rockets, that is also significantly cheaper than Gimlas ammunition at the cost of being easier for Russian air defense systems to intercept. Another possibility, if any of the stockpile is still intact and viable, is that Ukraine has sent some of the older rocket designs for these systems. The first M270 rockets had very little to do with the modern Gimlers. The original M26 rounds were shorter ranged, unguided, very cheap, and packed full of cluster munitions. They were intended to defeat massed attacks by Soviet armor on the battlefields of Europe, which sounds like something that might hypothetically be useful if one were dealing with massed Russian mechanized attacks on the fields of Europe. But given the events of the last week, this probably isn't where the focus is. GLSDB hasn't arrived, other rockets are purely hypothetical, but the ability of M270 and HIMARS systems to fire tactical ballistic missiles is very, very real, and as of a few days ago, very pertinent. Which brings us to the Army Tactical Missile System, or ATACMS. An American TBM that I was originally going to include as an example of a weapon which might act as a kind of game changer in the future, but which instead made a rather dramatic entry into Ukraine's missile arsenal only a day or two before this video was set to be recorded. Just a quick refresher on ATACMS, because I know we've talked about this system before. The MGM-140 is a system first fielded in the very early 1990s. It's a tactical ballistic missile fired from systems like M270 and HIMARS in a very modular fashion. Essentially, instead of loading a rocket pod with six 227mm rockets into HIMARS or two of them into an M270, you instead load a pod containing a single, larger, heavier ATACMS. Ukraine first began requesting this system in 2022, both because they desperately wanted a system with more range than the 80 kilometers that can be managed by the Gimlas rockets normally fired from HIMARS, and because their own stock of heavy-hitting TBMs, the Tochka U, were beginning to deplete rapidly. The US had long resisted the supply of ATACMs on various stated grounds, ranging from fears over escalation to concerns around the depth of America's ATACM stockpile. That was considered significant because ATACMs has been out of production for some time, and its successor, the Precision Strike Missile, is not yet available in significant quantities. But this week, for the first time, we saw these systems appear in Ukraine, and get used in Ukraine, with salvos of ATACMS missiles hitting at least two Russian targets, namely Russian airfields in Berdyansk and Luhansk. The Russians very obligingly almost immediately released images and footage of the target areas, as well as close-ups of the missile wreckage. And if you give a bunch of missile nerds on the internet access to image of rocket debris just like this, don't be surprised when they basically tell you that missile's life story. In this case, the released imagery showed that at least one of these missiles was an MGM-140 manufactured in October 1996. That in turn gives us two vital pieces of information. Firstly, that there is a non-zero chance that this particular missile was fired on its 26th birthday, but more importantly, that in terms of model, this is almost certainly a base model M39, aka the oldest, most baseline version of the ATACMS missile. We know that because the next version, the M39A1, only entered production in 1997. So what is there to say about the M39 specifically? The first is that compared to later versions, it has a much shorter range, maxing out at about 160 kilometers or 100 miles. It's also well into retirement age and no longer in active US use. Being both a cluster munition, which is a policy problem, while also lacking range and accuracy. This thing is in fact such a dinosaur of a weapon system that it doesn't even feature GPS guidance. It's inertial only. And given the modern US military would probably put GPS receivers in a rifle round if they thought they could get away with it, it should tell you a lot that this is a guided weapon system that doesn't have one. The flip side to that, of course, is that traditional countermeasures like jamming or GPS spoofing just won't work on it. As we've discussed before, one of Russia's attempted countermeasures to systems like JDAM or Gimlas has been to try and confuse the GPS system. 
That might not be enough to defeat Gimlers, but it might decrease accuracy. But trying to jam the M39 is like trying to hack a typewriter or use EMP to knock out a rowboat. The system is too old, dumb and basic to care. It achieves accuracy not by being pinpoint accurate, but rather by getting close enough and then dumping 950 submunitions over an area 200 metres wide. The later A1 model added GPS guidance and extended the range, but reduced that submunition count to 300. And later versions, still in use around the world, replaced the cluster warhead entirely with a unitary one. But the baseline M39 still reflects old Cold War thinking and as a result is basically a giant dump truck for cluster munitions. And in a sense, that's actually helpful here both for complicating Russia's air defence problem and simplifying supply. As an air defence problem, the missile must be intercepted because it can't be jammed. And furthermore, it must be intercepted before it releases its submunition payload. Secondly, in terms of supply, this is not a top-shelf American system that's currently being actively used. Instead, the M39 stockpile were either slated for conversion into much more modern versions of the ATACMS missile, or for decommissioning and retirement. Approximately 1,600 of these missiles are believed to have been produced, 400 or so expended in various US campaigns, and several hundred more slated for conversion into the much more modern M57E1 GPS-guided unitary version. But that still potentially leaves hundreds of these missiles that, if they pass safety inspection, might be available to supply to Ukraine rather than meet their alternative fate of being decommissioned in the United States. This week, we probably saw somewhere between 9 and 20 of these missiles being fired at Russian targets. And given the video and other evidence available to us, we can already do an impact and efficiency assessment on that set of missiles. The two airbases in question mostly housed Russian helicopters. And as the first videos of fires began to hit the internet, we also saw Russian channels commenting. One Russian source described the airbases as having been attacked with ATACMS missiles, and described it as one of, or potentially the most significant strike of all time since Russia's February 2022 invasion. The dour observation was that there were, quote, losses in both people and equipment, end quote. And given that previously a very bad day for Russian aviation might mean the loss of four or so platforms, I do think the evidence suggests that this one will take the record. We got on-the-ground footage at Berdyansk showing a number of fires at the airfield, which internet users obviously quickly corroborated against three strong returns on NASA's firm system, which is normally used to detect wildfires, essentially confirming that yes, things were burning at the airfield and doing so with enough intensity that they were noticeable from space. We also received reporting from claimed witnesses saying that not only were helicopters themselves burning, but there were also ammunition fires that continued to cook off for some hours. Then, satellite images of both known target locations started to surface, and it started to become clearer just how significant this strike had been. For the less significant of the two targets, the airbase in Luhansk, we got this image released by Front Intelligence Insights, who I've talked about before. The reason I'd suggest this is probably worse than it first appears is because of all those tiny little pockmarks that you can see on the surface there. Most of those, and they did compare it to an old image to make sure they're not just oil stains, for example, are probably the marks of where the submunitions from the cluster warhead on the M39 have hit the ground. And as you can see, the area is absolutely carpeted in them. Now, those tiny little submunitions aren't going to blast a piece of equipment into a hundred different pieces. But that doesn't stop them, for example, putting a bunch of small holes in the target. And aircraft, either fixed wing or rotary, are not known for their tolerance of having a bunch of holes in their sensitive components, like wings, engines, etc. It's also worth noting, I think, that this pattern illustrates why another traditional Russian defensive mechanism might not work particularly well against this type of weapon. Russia and many other air forces like to use revetments to protect aircraft that don't have full hardened hangars. This is basically where you build up a three-sided earthwork around each aircraft, with the idea being that if one aircraft is hit in its revetment, those earthworks should protect the others from things like fragmentation and blast. Essentially, you're increasing the odds that each missile can only destroy one aircraft and only do it with a direct hit or a very near miss. But M39 doesn't hit a point target, it carpets an area. So a revetment isn't going to do much. The imagery we've been getting after the Badyansk strike suggests it was even more damaging. Although even with top-tier blob interpretation experts on the case, it'll probably be a few days before we have a final figure. The big clues so far have been the Russians evacuating any helicopter that presumably is still capable of flying, while also going through the process of removing the rotors from approximately six others, which is a step you would often take if you intend to transport a helicopter by road. For the moment, most of the estimates of how many helicopters were destroyed versus damaged comes down to the eye of the beholder.
What do you consider destroyed versus minor versus serious damage as it's visible on a satellite view? I've seen some arguing, for example, the helicopter shown on screen here is only lightly damaged and will soon be serviceable, while others reckon it's further along the spectrum towards setting it on fire and claiming the insurance. For what it's worth, the current Oryx estimate is 7 car 52s definitely destroyed and 8 damaged to various degrees, with at least some of those likely being non-recoverable. That would constitute more than 10% of the February 2022 car 52 fleet, and a significantly higher percentage of the airframes that remain undamaged and operational this far into the war. Estimates for other helicopter types were 2 destroyed and 7 damaged. But again, please note, these are very much in the eye of the beholder, and that especially when you're talking about potentially lightly damaged aircraft, albeit ones surrounded by visible cluster munitions impacts, there are very much going to be arguments over classification. And that's before we consider the impact of any ammunition depots destroyed at these two sites, which is something we absolutely shouldn't do. The Russian Car 52 specifically are so dangerous to Ukrainian forces because they're capable of firing long-range anti-tank guided missiles, so it stands to reason that some of those missiles will probably be stockpiled at their airfields. Those missiles are neither cheap nor available in infinite quantities. Pre-February 2022, Russia's annual production run of something like the 9K121 was probably only a couple of hundred per annum. And every one destroyed in this attack is potentially one less to be fired at either a Ukrainian armoured vehicle or a piece of farm machinery. So if the count of damaged and destroyed equipment is our effectiveness measure, what about efficiency? And here we could potentially be very cheeky. We could argue, for example, that these missiles are slated for decommissioning, they would have a disposal cost, and therefore the efficiency of their deployment to Ukraine is in fact a saving on the part of the US government, and that as a result these weapons are infinitely efficient because everything gets more entertaining in mathematics once you start dividing things by zero. But if we instead take a potentially more reasonable replacement cost or original cost approach, you're going to end up with missiles costing between 1 and 2 million US dollars per shot, but at the same time quite a low logistics training and sustainment burden. ATACMs aren't particularly difficult to shift, they're relatively compact, and Ukraine already had the HIMARS and M270 systems and the crews to operate them. Taking a very rough ballpark figure of 15 million US dollars for a Kamal 52, then depending on exactly how many missiles were fired and where you fit in that 1 to 2 million dollar estimate range, the break even price, if you want to call it that for this sort of attack, was probably somewhere between 1 and 2 helicopters. As you can see from the satellite imagery, the Ukrainians almost certainly did considerably better than that. And then you have to take into account the wider impact, our but for test. And here there are factors that will probably both give the Ukrainians reasons for satisfaction and also deep frustration. Basically depending on whether you're evaluating what is actually happening now, or whether you're considering what might have been. From a here and now perspective, there are probably reasons that Ukraine will see this as a win far beyond just the monetary value of the helicopters and munitions destroyed. For example, destroyed helicopters can't be used to fly missions against Ukrainian forces. Therefore it's important not just that Russia has lost a valuable military asset, but that Ukraine might be able to keep some of its. Armoured vehicles, for example, that may otherwise have been destroyed by these helicopters flying missions in the future. That effect is likely to be compounded by the fact that Russia has begun to evacuate these airfields and will need to either move its helicopters further back or find some way to disperse or protect them. Way back in 2022, I talked a little bit about Russian doctrine and why they might want to base their rotary aviation assets so close to the front. A key reason there, of course, is response and loiter time. The closer you are to the front, the quicker you can respond to a call from help from the front, and the more fuel you're going to have to hang around for a while once you get there. If Russian helicopters now fall back further, out of M39 range, then the ability of the surviving parts of the fleet to respond to future Ukrainian offensive action at short notice is going to be diminished. So if you're Ukraine, you're probably thinking, hey, that's fantastic, I've destroyed a bunch of helicopters and I'm likely to reduce the effectiveness of the remaining ones. But therein is also the bittersweet part of this evaluation. Because remember, Ukraine was asking for these weapon systems in 2022. Meanwhile, some of the greatest impacts of the Russian attack helicopter fleet on this war were made in June and July of this year, where ATGM-equipped helicopters were a major factor in blunting Ukraine's initial counteroffensive operation, with Russian sources claiming to release video of more than 100 claimed Kamal 52 strikes during that peak mechanised phase of the Ukrainian effort. And while it's obviously just a hypothetical and we'll never know the answer for certain, it's interesting to ask what would have happened if these weapons had been supplied before the counteroffensive and these attacks had taken place at the same time. What might have changed or how many losses may have been mitigated if the attack helicopters hadn't made the same contribution, either by virtue of being on fire, grounded or evacuated? 
I ask the question not because I can provide a definitive answer, but because it illustrates a point. The extent to which a system becomes a quote-unquote game-changer is not just a product of how good it is at its job or how many of them are provided. The when very much also matters. Something tells me World War II might have been considerably shorter if the Americans had rocked up with the atomic bomb in 1942. Now, thankfully, no one has been deploying atomic weapons in Ukraine, but one thing the Russians have been deploying on a significant scale is their Lancet loitering munition. Lancet is the most famous and probably the most impactful of Russia's expanding family of loitering munitions. Basically, weapons that have the endurance and capacity to, you guessed it, loiter in an area until a target is found and they can be tasked against it. Compared to the more common and cheaper FPV drones we see a bunch of in Ukraine, distinguishing features tend to include range, endurance, cost, and the way they are piloted and targeted. The system is believed to be relatively new in Russian service, having first been combat tested as far as we know in Syria in 2020. And of course, it comes in a variety of sizes and versions for all occasions, ranging from the small Lancet 1, a 5kg system with a 1kg warhead and about 30 minutes of endurance, up to larger versions with warheads of 3 or even 5 kilos and significantly extended reach. And while it's not critical to today's discussion, Lancet does come up a lot when people are discussing sanctions busting in Russia because according to a number of reports, the thing is supposed to be absolutely full of foreign components. Something which I imagine must be deeply frustrating for Ukrainians every time one of these things buzzes towards them, swooping down like some sort of mechanical magpie that is at once both much more explosive and also somewhat less aggressive than the real deal. Lancet has received plenty of hype, particularly in Russian state media, and so I think it absolutely deserves an inclusion on today's list. And so if we start with the question of impact, the data certainly suggests that Lancet has had a major one. According to the Oryx database, up to the period March 2023, we had visual confirmation of 113 Lancet hits on Ukrainian equipment. That included 11 tanks, 8 armoured fighting vehicles, 24 pieces of towed artillery, 25 self-propelled guns, 4 MLRS systems, 8 surface-to-air missiles, and 12 radars. Even if we didn't account for any subsequent hits, that'd still be pretty significant in some categories. For tanks, it's barely noticeable, but presumably the Russians knew that slamming one or three kilogram warheads into tanks probably wasn't the best use of the system. Instead, Lancet seems to have thrived in the counter-battery role. Because to put those numbers into perspective, whereas in March we had visual evidence of 24 Lancet strikes against Ukrainian towed artillery pieces, the total number of Ukrainian towed artillery pieces visually confirmed destroyed or damaged as of October was only 160 and there is no reason to believe that Lancet strikes slowed down after March. Quite the contrary. Switching over to a Russian source, Lost Armor, they also keep track of hits by systems like Lancet on Ukrainian equipment, and the pattern in their data shows a significant increase from the periods leading up to March 2023 to a truly massive surge in July and August. Coincided, it should be noting, with the more mechanized phases of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, before dropping back to more or less their March-April frequency in September and October. Data from some other sources I reviewed didn't always agree on the scale with the Russian data set, but they did generally accord with the overall pattern, a surge in June, July and August, followed by a drop-off. Now it's worth noting that not all Lancet hits are created equal, and the system and countermeasures have continued to evolve over the course of the fighting. The Russians have, for example, had to continually enlarge the warhead and the system as a whole, because the Lancet 1 and even the Lancet 3 are noted as having something of a lethality problem. Essentially, they could hit and probably damage something, but wouldn't necessarily destroy it. As Rusi observed, quote, The lethality of Lancet is often insufficient. It is apparent from videos that crews can often hear the munition approaching, as they often have time to disperse before it strikes. One officer also said that although he had seen his gun destroyed several times online, it remained alive and well. Quote, but the warhead is being enlarged and Russian tactics are evolving, culminating in a recent incident where what appear to be extended range versions of the Lancet were used to attack a Ukrainian airbase. The first video that was released appeared to show a Lancet striking a parked MiG-29, reportedly at an airbase at least 50 miles from the front line, which, considering the legs on a baseline Lancet model will probably only take it about 40 kilometers, is a significant hike. For a relatively cheap loitering munition like this one, this is a very expensive, very valuable target. And it also doesn't appear to have just been a one-time thing, because we also got another video from the same location, it seems, of a Sukhoi 25 being struck, probably around the same time. In that image you have on screen there, the circled smudge is the incoming munition. Now, I'm just going to take a moment here to discuss with some incredulity the impact of this incident. 
because in any war, mistakes are made and things go wrong. That's just the nature of the activity. But there are probably things to be said about both Ukrainian and Russian approaches based on these videos. For Ukraine, the concern is obvious, valuable aircraft being destroyed by cheap munitions, and the unexplained fact that the Russian spotting and designating drone that is coordinating these attacks was able to apparently hover near this airbase and bring in the Lancets. Very much a what air defense doing moment. But for the Russians, meanwhile, I also have questions. This is an interesting demonstration of a longer range loitering munition being used in a different way. It is also very clearly a very valuable strike. But for me, it also raises the question, how on earth were the Ukrainians using an airbase 50 miles from the front line? Russia is meant to have crews and tactical ballistic missiles. Heck, they're meant to have long-range unguided MLRS systems, and it's not like a runway moves much. It shouldn't take world-leading ISR capabilities to figure out that there are some aircraft at an airbase, and maybe, just maybe, you should drop some long-range fires on that thing. So the use of a loitering munition here is definitely interesting. It just strikes me as something that shouldn't be necessary if all the other components of the Russian military were performing as they should on paper. To get back to Lancet and Russian loitering munitions, the story is very much continuing to evolve. It's reported, for example, that Lancet is meant to be joined by a new system, which is both cheaper and also has a larger warhead. At the same time, Ukrainian forces continue to adapt to the presence of systems like Lancet on the battlefield. That means both better hard and soft kill countermeasures, like shooting it down or jamming it, but also just super high-tech expedients like building protective cages around artillery systems. Because while something like a javelin or an in-law is going to give between zero and no shits about a protective cage around an armoured vehicle, a lot of FPV drones and loitering munitions are still at the point where they can generally be hard countered by the simple expedient of building a fence around the vehicle. But of course, to go back to the but 4 test, all of those adaptations come with cost. If you're relying on things like fixed cages and camouflage, you probably can't relocate your system as often. If you're dedicating resources to jamming or shooting down Lancet, you're not using those same resources for something else. So just like you could argue that a system like Javelin might impose attacks on how Russian armor can operate, you might argue that Lancet and similar systems impose attacks on how Ukrainian artillery and air defenses can operate. And to come to a more efficiency-based measure, that tax that systems like Lancet impose on the Ukrainians probably aren't coming at a particularly high cost to Russia. Of course, the only way to calculate that is to know how many Lancets Russia is producing and firing relative to the number of losses we're seeing. As of July, for example, Ukrainian media carried estimates of the Russians producing between 50 and 100 Lancets per month. That number has since probably increased. At the same time, you'll find pro-Russian sources estimating figures anywhere from 1,000 to 45,000 per month. This is another case, just as when some pro-Russian sources were probably massively overstating the number of artillery shells Russia was firing during parts of 2022, where it's probably better for Russia if the Ukrainian figures are accurate as opposed to their own propaganda numbers. If you're producing and using around 100 per month to hit 50 targets, your engagement success rate is about 50%. If you're sending 45,000 to achieve the same number of hits, suddenly your success rate is one-tenth of one percent. At this point, I'd suggest a sober estimate is probably somewhere in the low single-digit thousands, which, at an estimated price of 35,000 per Lancet 3, would mean a production run of 2,000 would come at a relatively minor cost of about 70 million US dollars. Now, obviously, that's not accounting for all the other costs around the system. You need to put up drones to spot for Lancet, for example. They tend to be more expensive than the Lancet, and they too get shot down and lost. But the system is so cheap relative to some of its targets that unless so many are being fired that it causes localized eclipses, this is a system that is probably going to score pretty highly on the efficiency count. In terms of total impact, that is targets damaged or destroyed, obviously this is a system which has destroyed considerably less Ukrainian equipment than, for example, the Russian artillery but there is an orders of magnitude difference in the investment involved. Finally, it forces Ukrainian adaptations, and as a result, would probably score pretty well on holistic analysis or that but for test. But for Lancet, Ukraine would have more artillery systems in service, and they wouldn't have to employ as many counter-Lancet mechanisms. But for Lancets, it would be safer for Ukrainian air defense systems to move a little bit closer to the front line. And but for Lancet and similar systems, there might be a subtly different dynamic in the ongoing artillery war. Ukrainian crews, for example, wouldn't be as punished for keeping propellant and shells close to the gun, something which, in a number of these Lancet videos, seems to have been the reason that a relatively small warhead was able to cause catastrophic damage. So while I acknowledge we're working with a lot of very soft estimates here around successful engagement, losses, and the number of Lancets fired, it strikes me that this is probably an example of a Russian-built system 
that is both cost-efficient and has had a noticeable impact on the battlefield. If it doesn't get the title of Game Changer in Ukraine, it would probably only be for reasons of comparatively insufficient lethality, and the fact the Russians seem just not to have had enough of these things to deploy them at the sort of scale that this conflict demands, causing the drone to lose out in relative terms to things like cheaper and more available FPV drones, and of course the Russian artillery. So switching now from the small and cheap to the big and expensive, I want to evaluate some of the heavily armoured vehicles that have been nominated as game changers before being sent to Ukraine. And because that's a pretty wide field, I'm going to narrow it somewhat for this episode, focusing on one Russian vehicle we'll get to in a bit, and three recent generation Western main battle tanks. The Challenger 2 from the United Kingdom, M1A1 Abrams from the United States, and various versions of the Leopard 2, originally designed in Germany. I'd argue these systems very clearly pass our media hype requirement, as the so-called Free the Leopards campaign became a very public international phenomenon. It was also in a way a symbol of just how much discourse in Germany and the surrounding nations had changed since 2021. It was only a couple of years ago that Germany was having a very public debate on whether or not they should arm their own drones. Cut to 2023 and you had public demonstrations demanding that main battle tanks be sent to an Eastern European country in the middle of a war. Clearly another sterling win for Russian foreign policy and influence campaigns. Once the announcements started coming, the hype continued to evolve. Russian media ran articles arguing basically how useless all of these Western main battle tanks were, while many Western media organisations repeatedly asked whether or not these systems would be a game changer. Now, with the benefit of at least some hindsight, we can start to ask who may have been closer to the truth. First, we need to understand how many vehicles were pledged and sent. According to the trackers at Oryx, that's about 130 recent generation Western main battle tanks. As those announcements were being made, there was a lot of discussion about the costs involved in training, support and sustaining those sort of vehicles in the Ukrainian theatre. Our best clue when it comes to the ballpark figure for all of those things taken together is actually the US package that originally was announced for Abrams. That was costed at 400 million US dollars for 31 at that point new vehicles, something which was later revised to using existing vehicles. And then as well as the tanks themselves, eight recovery vehicles, various support vehicles and equipment, training, maintenance, sustainment and ammunition for the above. The key point here is that while this effort was reasonably expensive, in the scale of this war it didn't really generate a strategically significant number of new tanks. As at time of recording, about 5% of those pledged recent generation tanks have been visually confirmed destroyed, and a further 9% visually confirmed damage, at least some of which we know have later been repaired. The percentage lost by type does vary from 0% from the M1A1 Abrams, a remarkable feat of survivability they mostly achieved by only being delivered late last month. Meanwhile, for the Leopard 2A6s that have often found themselves at the vanguard of Ukrainian mechanised pushers, the figures are 3 destroyed and 6 damaged or abandoned. And those figures start to give us some clues about the effect or non-effect of these kind of vehicles. On the effect side, what these Western main battle tanks seem to be good at so far is not catastrophically disassembling themselves and deleting their crews every time they hit a landmine or encounter enemy fire. Looking at visually confirmed tank losses for the war as a whole on both sides, both Russia and Ukraine, over the course of this war on average, have lost 1.9 tanks destroyed for every one that is either damaged, abandoned, or captured. Now, there are huge questions around data like this, particularly when it comes to things like vehicles being thoroughly destroyed after they have been knocked out and abandoned. But for the data as we have it, about two-thirds of tank losses in general are full destructions. For Russia's best operational tank, the T-90M, about 60% of losses are destructions. And then for Western MBTs, it's about a third. If those numbers hold going forward, and trust me, this is very imperfect data, by the time all of these Western MBTs have become losses at least once, you would expect around 43 Ukrainian tank crews to find themselves in or escaping from a vehicle that has been damaged or knocked out, as opposed to being catastrophically destroyed. Meanwhile, the Ukrainian military will have 43 additional vehicles that may be recoverable or repairable, as opposed to total write-offs. At a strategic level for this war, that's probably not game-changing. Although the family and friends of the tank crews in question would probably say it had absolutely been an effective investment. Assessing the total impact on Russian forces is more difficult to do. What we can say is these 130 tanks don't seem to have enabled a significant Ukrainian breakthrough, nor have they been frequently engaging in tank-to-tank -tank duels with opposing Russian forces, although tank duels have happened on a number of documented occasions. For the most part, instead, we've seen Western main battle tanks being used as long-range anti-vehicle weapons or against fixed Russian positions like trenches. That's obviously an important tactical role, but there's nothing to say that a T-80 couldn't do the same job in most circumstances. 
Similarly, trying to assess the overall impact and do that but for test doesn't exactly suggest these vehicles have been complete game changers. If Ukraine didn't have 100 or 130 good quality additional tanks, well, it wouldn't have 100 to 130 good quality additional tanks. That might have made some individual engagements significantly harder and meant some units had to do without. But in the end, the quantities just haven't been that great and this hasn't really been a tank war per se. And until one or both of those factors ultimately change, it seems probable that other systems will continue to be more decisive in steering the course of battle. But if you thought the NATO countries had a monopoly on supposed game-changing armoured vehicles in Ukraine, you would be wrong. And so I'm going to take a moment to talk about just one Russian example as well, the BMPT Terminator. Now the BMPT has a superpower. Namely, it gives you or anyone else the ability to light any serious military discussion board on fire simply by calling this thing a tank. That's because, despite being built on a main battle tank hull, it's probably best described instead as a tank support vehicle. Now, I would love to talk about the Terminator and its development more in the future, but for now, here's the spark notes. Soviet and Russian experiences in places like Afghanistan and Chechnya was that tanks can have real difficulty dealing with certain environments. In the mountains of Afghanistan, infantry firing from the mountains down on the tanks below was a problem. And in Chechnya, infantry in urban environments, particularly when they did annoying things like get themselves on rooftops and then fire downwards, were likewise a problem. The very Russian response to this problem, which was at its core just an expression of the inherent vulnerability of the tank in certain environments, was to try and protect the tanks by adding more not-quite tanks. The conceptual solution underpinning BMPT is to take something heavily protected, like a T-72 tank chassis, and then mounting a remote-controlled weapon station on top with a suite of weapons designed to deal with things that a tank's 125mm cannon aren't optimised to deal with. As a result, the model of BMPTs that we've seen in Ukraine mount two 30mm cannon, four anti-tank guided missiles, some AGS grenade launchers, and machine guns. Now, whether this is a good concept or not, and whether this is a good vehicle or not, is something I'll leave the armour experts to debate. I've read Russian sources with plenty of negative things to say about the vehicle, like for example the fact the weapon station is not armoured, and then at the other extreme you'll find Western sources saying that this thing is terrifying and the future of armoured warfare. But for the purpose of this video, we're mainly concerned with what impact the 10 or so that we believe may have been sent to Ukraine actually had. Because these things absolutely passed our hype check when they first started getting sent to Ukraine, and despite only a comparative handful of systems being involved, expectations were apparently high. We got a couple of videos of BMPT apparently on operation. At least one was of the vehicle appearing to operate as Russian doctrine and thinking seems to suggest it should be, being used alongside regular main battle tanks. From memory, that engagement ended when artillery fire started landing in the area and the collection of armoured vehicles pulled back. Another video released by Russian media showed BMPT firing 30mm cannons at targets off-screen. The arrival of the vehicles wasn't correlated with any sudden change in movement on the front. Ukrainian sources don't appear to have reacted to their arrival at any scale or shown any particular concern. And it almost seems to have been like engaging 10 additional armoured vehicles in a war that already matched hundreds or thousands on both sides against each other wasn't making a noticeable difference. Then in February, we got our first footage of a Terminator being terminated. Thoroughly burnt out and wrecked by Ukrainian artillery, this was one vehicle that very clearly wasn't going to be back. Another was at least damaged in August 2023, and footage came out of another one being damaged the following month. By which point, if that initial 10 estimate was true, a third of the committed vehicles had either been damaged or destroyed. But being a game changer isn't just about the losses you take, it's about the effect you have on your opponent which would be a potential salvation for the BMPT in Ukraine if we had evidence of it doing anything interesting or particularly valuable. But I haven't seen any such evidence. The vehicles appear to have remained in use from time to time, and in July we got a report from the Russians. This included video and a statement from the authorities showing that a BMPT was being used in night missions, reportedly near Avdivka, as basically a 30mm cannon platform. And indeed, in this Russian release, the main achievement of the vehicle during its night of operations seems to have been firing reportedly 430mm rounds at Ukrainian positions. Now, I don't want to dismiss the importance of 30mm cannon in Ukraine. They've been very influential weapons. Just as during the Age of Sail, if you wanted a quick shorthand for the combat power of a ship, you'd count how many cannons it mounted, you could do worse when talking about Russian or Ukrainian mechanised infantry than simply counting up how many 30 mils they have. But from a defence economics perspective, from a game changer perspective, I just have so many questions. Not specifically about the value of the BMPT vehicle, but the value of the BMPT program. 
This is a vehicle with its own development program, its own machine tooling, its own sustainment pathway, its own training, its own supporting logistics, its own crews. And the net result of all of that investment seems to have been to deliver, more or less, 10 sets of 30mm cannons to Ukraine with slightly better than normal night and thermal optics. While they may not have been as protected or as capable, one wonders how many other 30mm equipped armoured vehicles the Russians may have been able to field. Or indeed, given the nature of the fighting, how many regular tanks they might have been able to reactivate using those same resources to likely achieve much more significant military impacts and without giving us all fodder for really bad Arnold Schwarzenegger jokes. So in terms of impact, that may be debated, but we don't have hard evidence of it achieving very much of anything at all. In terms of efficiency, the cost of achieving not very much at all was having a development, testing, fielding and sustainment program just for these vehicles, and the result of that but for test, what likely would have happened if these vehicles didn't exist, is as always uncertain, but my reasoned argument would be basically nothing different. Russia would have saved some on its military and media budget, so maybe they might have deployed other vehicles. But in a war like Ukraine, 10 of any armoured vehicle isn't going to be a game changer. So if this was a game changer tier list, I'd probably nominate the BMPT for a not at all glorious D rank. So where does that leave us trying to assess the impact of all of these much hyped weapon systems? Albeit with the understanding that probably no matter what the findings are, the search for silver bullets on both sides is likely to continue regardless. My general view, if it hasn't already come through, is that the term game changer isn't itself particularly useful, but evaluating the impact and efficiency of a system against expectations, that there might be some value in. It'll probably vary greatly, however, depending on how you choose to measure that expectation and performance, and what performance categories you tend to prioritise. For example, here I've put both High Mars and Lancet one level down from the top of the list. That's because I generally assess both systems as having lived up to a lot of the hype around them, while also making effective and efficient ongoing contributions to the war effort. But try and compare the two systems to each other, and it's basically apples and oranges. They have very little in common. And even if you just apply our three very basic metrics, you still end up with a problem. The Lancet probably wins on cost efficiency just by virtue of being so bloody cheap, but the total impact of those MLRS systems in terms of targets destroyed and the way in which they shape the war is probably, I would argue, significantly greater. Then you have systems like Javelin that were clearly extremely important and probably lived up to some of their hype in the early months of the war, but are now more ongoing but ultimately secondary contributors, while systems like Western Main Battle Tanks and the TOS 1A probably didn't live up to some of the hype the media gave them, but that doesn't mean those systems aren't making valuable contributions to the overall war effort. Only when you start getting down to systems like the BMPT are you talking about things that not only didn't live up to their hype as far as we can tell, but where the actual net value of fielding the system starts to come into question. I'll stress again that there are other ways you could set up this list and other findings you could make, either because you're using different data or valuing different criteria differently. But for illustrative purposes, I hope you find this useful. You will probably note, by the way, that I have left some room at the absolute top of this list. I'm reserving that just in case we do a sequel and it becomes time to talk about systems that didn't receive a huge amount of public hype, but which I would argue have nonetheless probably made very significant contributions. That category may often be where you find the systems that are truly disruptive, that are so effective or efficient that they may change the way wars are fought in the future, and that militaries design their forces and tactics. But as I said, that's probably material for another time. In conclusion, the words game changer are probably going to mean different things to different people. There are, however, a variety of metrics you might use if you want to assess whether or not a system has positively contributed to a particular war effort. And today we went through three of those, direct impact, efficiency, and the holistic impact slash but for test. As far as the war in Ukraine is concerned, at least some systems probably have lived up to at least most of their original hype. Lancet and the new ATACMs equipped HIMARS, for example, are probably very much on that list. Others have been comparative failures, but most probably sit somewhere in the middle. And here it's probably worthwhile closing out with this thought. True game-changing systems, proverbial silver bullets, are incredibly rare in history. But being able to build up, aggregate, and apply a lot of more reasonable capabilities, well, that's something that's been decisive in a lot of different human conflicts. There's nothing game-changing about a howitzer or a Leopard 2 main battle tank. But that doesn't mean that having more of them wouldn't significantly increase Ukrainian combat power. And so while it's reasonable to try and identify and prioritise true standout systems, that doesn't mean that all effort should be turned away from making sure there's a sufficient supply of that stuff sitting in the middle. As always, it's dangerous to focus too much on the bling and forget the basics. And okay, channel update to close out. 
Firstly, thanks to all of you who engaged with the video on the IDF last week. I'm very much aware that was a sensitive topic, YouTube certainly agreed, but I felt it was a topic that had to be covered and I hope you're happy generally with the way I covered it. This week's video is a topic that was selected by my patrons. Taking a chance to try and leverage some of the data on hindsight we're starting to accumulate after more than 600 days of full-scale war to make at least some high-level observations about the systems involved. There are, as I said, a long list of other systems that could be evaluated from the extremely successful to the abject failures, but I'll wait to see how this video goes before I commit to producing any sequels. Finally, I'll flag that as always, I've got a couple of significant projects running in the background. I'm hoping my video in India, for example, will finally be ready for release sometime in November. Although for that one, I might have a request for community assistance, which I'll bring back to the channel next week. Until then, just let me wish all of you the very best as always. Thank you very much for continuing to engage with this content, and I'll see you all again next week.